Can anyone ask me or any member of the family about the danger of one of the court lines before the 2nd of January last year? I wouldn't know what would happen with it. Never did. But unfortunately, that day changed my family's life for a while. Dean, as you see here, was upstairs in his bedroom. His mum left him up for his afternoon nap, which she was downstairs and his dad was in and sorting out toys in the bedroom, in a different bedroom. Dean's uncle Martin, who was with us today, went upstairs to talk to Dean's dad, Michael. When he looked into Dean's room, he seen Dean with the collar around his neck, and Dean without a bed. Martin shouted to Michael and the two of them jumped over the safety gate of the bedroom and they got Dean free. They rushed him to Trilly Hospital, giving them CPR to wait. When they got there, the doctors managed to get a pulse and put Dean in the ventilator and moved him into intensive care. Uh, we were told then Dean would have to be moved to our Davies Hospital in Dublin and he was there after that night. Joanne, my cousin myself, drove up full of hope that things were going to be okay. <coughs> Dean was, had a pulse, he was starting to breathe. But let me tell you a bit about Dean first. When Dean was born, he was a big baby. He was 12 pounds, 13 ounces. Maybe rare. <laughs> <laughs> he had his first tooth when he was two months. He was crawling at five months and he was walking at nine months. <laughs> A stubborn wee bugger. <laughs> if you took that part after me, I'd know. But uh, he wouldn't give up on anything. Uh, Dean got his mind to do something. He had to stop till he, till he got it done. Uh, he loved the nursery rain. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. He loved being called little star. So that's what his mum called him all the time. Uh, he loved hugs and kisses. Some children would give a hug and kiss the whole way, but he would come over to you just looking for a hug and a kiss. And if he didn't give one, he would stop. He thought he would show that until he got one. <laughs> My last happy memory of Dean was on one of my visits when I was down there about two or three times a year. I was getting ready to come home. And this afternoon was up in his bedroom playing with his cars and, and he was ticking and carrying on. And he, was, he was laughing that much, the tears were dripping running down his face. And when I was leaving, he hugged and kissed me that much and I had my neck for two days after. <laughs> but when we got to when we got to Dublin, they Immediately brought Dean into intensive care and they started to do a test and things like that. Come the following evening, we were starting to get worried that Dean was showing signs really of recovery. Uh, they started doing more tests on him again, and then on the Thursday, the doctors told us that Dean was pretty dead. So, his brain was stirred with oxygen, and we had only a few days to take the bite. Which, only for Mark and his son, but he caught him when he did, but when I had that time. Very proud of him for that. So, Joanna and Michael then had to make the heartbreaking decision of when Dean's machine had been switched off. Uh, so the decision was made that the machines were going to be switched off on the Friday. They were able to make that decision with the courage and the strength they had to make it. But to sit in the room and watch your daughter and son in law, along with Dean's other granddad, nursing their baby son, waiting on him to take his last breath. So heartbreaking. I never felt anything like it before. But 
But when this machine was switched off, the consultant told us that they would have you could take one breath, or it could maybe last five, ten minutes. But the stubborn got come back out of it again, and they lasted for an hour and a half. <coughs> but nothing ever prepares you for the death of a child. And what about anybody tells you? And some people say you get over it, you get over it, you don't. You learn to live with it. You'll never get over it. To sit in the room, you know, Dean had passed away in his mum's arms. Um, we didn't want to move, we didn't want to let him go. That night, I had to start making funeral arrangements for Dean. I never thought it would ever have to do anything like that. It should have been 40, 30 years ago, and we all did it in my group of people. Not the way about. The next day on the Saturday morning, we started the long journey home to Shirley. It seemed to take forever, but at the same time, we didn't want to be ahead. Uh, the way to do things in Dublin, I had Dean's little coffin in the back seat of my car with Dean's mum, Joanne, sitting alongside me and Martin's car behind with Dean's dad. Um, driving at a respectable speed and slowly down the road, snow and brown. Um, <coughs> just such, such a long, long journey. But to look at Dean in this coffin, the lower one is grave. <coughs> Watching your daughter and your son-in-law breaking their hearts, rips you bits. Every time I get out of the tree now, my first call is to the graveyard. See Dean. And excuse me. And uh, that's my last call with him. These simple devices here, if we had known about them, could have saved things like and countless all our children throughout Ireland and the UK and throughout Europe and the world. We didn't know about these. Believe you me, if we had a known Joanne's house was unbelievably safe. She had three safety gates, one at the bottom, one at the top of the stairs. She had safety gate in Joanne and Dean's bedroom. Our cupboard doors and all, children's locks, chain locks on them, bleaches, detergents, anything that's dangerous at all was kept well out of the way. She had two fire yards in our fire, spark yard and nursery yard. She was so conscious of anything happening to her children that she done her best again. We didn't know. 18 seconds. What would you do with it? Would you have time to go out to the kitchen and fill the kit? Would you put on the washing machine? Check the post? Switching the channels to the television? Them 18 seconds. Your child will be dead. That's all it takes. In one to three seconds, the child goes unconscious. The three to ten seconds, the oxygen has stopped going to the child's brain. And effectively, your child is breathing. In the other eight seconds, the child's heart stops. That's all it takes. And I can't emphasize that enough. Like in every 18 seconds. You can't, it's impossible to keep your eye on the chain. Every second, every minute, every hour of the day. You can't do it. That's why it's so important that people fit these to existing blinds in their house. They're not expensive. Most 
people, most providers of one of the so there's a good, maybe a shop in most villages and towns of the country. They're not very expensive and they're very easy to put up. And if you see if you check the But it was just been one week point I wanted to make about these. A few weeks ago, Daybreak Television in England uh, did a week campaign about these clips and safety devices. And some person or persons, I don't know who, has decided that it's a great idea to put the price of them up because of this campaign. So some smart one, maybe these in the other car, me and Holly, or change their car or something, I don't know, but whoever that person or persons are, you're a disgrace. It's my ultimate goal to bundle playing cards and complete them. Now, I know that's a long way away. I won't give up. As I said, Dean had to get a stubbornness from somewhere. I believe you mean something to get a stubborn. I won't give up till it happens. And I know last month there was a debate in Westminster and there was a debate uh, last year in the Dáil in Ireland about this. But, you know, the time for talking has stopped. It's now time for action. Uh, I was asking Francie, and as he was saying to you there a few minutes ago, Francie prepared to be in a motion here in this house to try and clean it into law. And I know the EU are publishing new guidelines shortly, and it's all welcome. You know, it's every, everything is welcome to, to highlight this and to prevent tragedies. But unfortunately, when it comes to the EU, guidelines is coming out, they are only guidelines. There's no one to police this. That's why I want it brought into law that all blinds been fitted in the country must be fitted with these safety devices as standard. And then we'd have someone to police this. The blind that killed Dean was sold in a large department store in Tralee, which they've got shots, most of monster went against the European regulations of 1999. I was down in Tralee just a few weeks ago for Dean's sister's communion. And the same shop is still selling that line yet. And I went that time to take the aid because of it. They're still selling it. You know, so regulations from the EU are great, but I don't see we can't ban the blinds in this country here because we have to do what Europe wants to the free market. So we have to do what fat cats around Europe want us to do. We can't protect our children because some other country wants to sell a blind in this country that's going to kill their children. Yo, I can't, I don't know, why can we not ban them completely? That'd be a nice legacy for them. If we could do something like this, and no one else has to stand up, but I have to be here. Thank you.